This is for those who believe in the potential of science. Making brave choices, choosing to push the boundaries. This is why we believe in what science can do. And these are coral reef islands. These were also once seamounts and active volcanoes that had coral reefs growing around their bases. And those volcanoes, slowly, over millions of years, sank below the surface of the ocean. But at the same time, the coral reef that was growing around its base grew upward to form a coral reef island. Those islands that you can see on that Google Earth image that I showed you earlier. Now, in 2012, we chartered a 72-foot sailboat out to one of these islands, my favorite island in the world, Jarvis Island, coral reef on the equator in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And as we get closer to the island with our sailboat, we start to see an enormous diversity and density of life. And megafauna, lots and lots of sharks. And all of this is made possible by a tiny, tiny creature that if you went snorkeling on a coral reef, you probably wouldn't even notice. You might not even be able to see. One millimeter in diameter. This creature is called a coral polyp. This is the animal that builds the coral reef. Now, it might look to you very much like a sea anemone, and in fact, it's related to a sea anemone, but it does one very important thing that distinguishes it. Day in and day out, this coral polyp takes calcium and carbonate ions from the seawater and puts them together to make calcium carbonate crystals. And 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year, this little animal is doing the most extraordinary thing. It's building a skeleton for itself that eventually will build the reef, all out of these tiny, tiny crystals that are very elegantly placed to make a skeleton. Now, the corals don't do this alone. Most of the corals that you see on reefs today live together in symbiosis with single-celled algae called zooxanthellae. And these algae, these little plants, live inside the coral cells. And they photosynthesize, just like plants on land. They fix carbon, and they give that carbon energy to the coral. In essence, they're feeding the coral. And these algae are the main source of food for the corals that build reefs in the oceans today. Now, another thing about the reef-building corals is that most of them are colonial. They live together with tens, hundreds, thousands of other coral polyps in the same colony. And together, they are all working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, to make those crystals and put them together into a skeleton. And what you're seeing here is a scanning electron microscope image of the surface of the skeleton that these coral polyps have built. And what you're looking at, each of these honeycomb-shaped features is the home for one polyp. It both supports the soft flesh, and it's also a home that the polyp can contract into when a parrotfish comes along to try and eat it. And over many, many years, Hundreds and thousands, up to millions of coral polyps in a colony keep growing and keep growing until they form sometimes enormous, bus-sized skeletal structures. Now, one of the things that we do when we go out to these reefs on our 72-foot sailboat 
is we take a biopsy of the coral. Because that coral that has lived there for many, many years contains in its skeleton information about the things that it's seen over its lifespan. This is my friend Jay Andrew. He was helping us on one of our cruises, and he's holding a handheld drill that's run by the compressed air from a scuba tank. So it's basically a little drill that you can hold in one hand that's run off the scuba tank. And what he's doing is he's drilling into the coral to get a sample. It's like a biopsy. And here's the image right here showing the skeletal core that comes out of the coral once Jay's finished drilling. Now, we don't hurt the coral when we do this. We're very, very careful to plug up the hole with a cement plug and epoxy around to make sure that the cement is kept in place. And then over time, just like a wound on your skin, the coral will grow over that plug. So that if I came back six months or a year later, I wouldn't even see that my plug was there. I wouldn't even know that anybody had taken a core out of my coral. What do we do with these cores? Well, we bring them back to the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, where we have a CT scanner. Just like one you find at the hospital that scans people. In fact, when I put my coral core on the CT scanner, I have to enter the name of the patient, the size of the patient, and the orientation of the patient on the CT scan bed. But we're not looking for human things here. We're looking for information that's contained within the coral itself. So here, my postdoc, Neil Canton, and I are sending a very long core through the CT scanner. And this is what we do. Here's the original core, and then we can take all those different 181 different CT scan files and pull them together on the computer to reconstruct a three-dimensional image of that coral skeleton. And that's shown here in slide B. And then also on the computer, I can manipulate the three-dimensional image, and I can cut through it to show me the inside of the skeleton. And what do I see? I see these bands, these dark bands. And I've shown some of them here with yellow arrows. And what those bands are are annual growth bands. These are much like rings on a tree. These corals are growing their skeletons in annual density layers. And I can count those bands to find out how old that coral is. And I can measure the distance between the bands to tell me how fast the coral is growing. And I can see, if I count the bands over a long period of time, how the coral growth rates have changed. And some of these coral cores are really, really long. This one here that we're showing off, a bunch of folks from my lab, was four, is four meters long. This coral has been growing for 400 years, and it was still growing when we took the core sample. So here's a series of events that this coral has grown through, a series of important events in American history. It was born 400 years ago, just over 400 years ago, in 1600 AD. It lived through the invention of the steam engine, the American Revolution, the abolishment of slavery, the attack on Pearl Harbor. And when Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone in 2007, that coral 
was still growing. And then we came and sampled it three years later in 2010. Of course, the coral was oblivious to all of these things that were going on in the US. But there were, at the same time, changes that have been going on in the ocean that the coral has been feeling very strongly. And one of the most important changes has been to the ocean's temperature. As humans have put more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the Earth has warmed up. And as the Earth has warmed up, so have the oceans. And this map shows the change through time in temperature of the global oceans since 1900, past 115 years or so. And as you can see, everywhere for where we have information, the map is basically red or yellow. The oceans have warmed up significantly over the past 100 years. And the corals have been feeling this. And in fact, they are trying to tell us. One of the things that, one of the features that we're seeing consistently in our CT scans of the coral cores are bright white bands, like this one here. Very hard to miss. Anybody want to hazard a guess what that is? Perfect. This coral is stressed. It made a stress band, and it put it down in its skeleton for me to see. What's happening is that as the oceans have warmed up, the corals have started to lose those symbiotic algae that are living in its tissues and giving it food. So here is a healthy coral. You see how nice and purple it is, and that purple color actually comes from the algae that are living inside its tissue. Healthy coral, growing beautifully, very happy, making its skeleton. Down here to your right is what the coral looks like under high temperature, when the temperatures get too hot. They extrude their zooxanthellae, their little symbiotic algae that are feeding them. They lose their color and turn white. And that's why the corals, are, uh, that's where the term bleaching comes from. And because they have lost their main source of food, these corals are basically starving. And many of them will die. In 2015 was the hottest year on record in the central tropical Pacific. We went back to our beautiful island on the equator in November 2015 to find 80% of our corals bleached and the rest were dead. Down to 90 feet, everything was either white, signifying bleaching, or covered in a green mass of algae. As far as we could go, as far as we could dive, this island, our beautiful island, was bleached. Now we're planning to go back in May of this year, that's next month. And the main question on our minds is, did these corals, did those surviving corals, the ones that were still bleached but still alive, did they manage to make it through this warm, this tremendously warm event? So if you happen to be making the trip from California, Los Angeles, LAX, to Australia in May, you can look out of the window right down there as you, as you pass over the equator, 160 west. And we'll be there 
on that reef, fingers crossed that those corals were able to make it through. Thank you very much for your attention.